It is also a very important signal for us bishops that we are not above the law. The courage of sexual abuse victims has caused a sea change. Sexual abuse is no longer tolerated in our churches or the sports world. The Catholic Church confronts its sin. And in the U.S., more than 700 people preyed upon by pastors in Southern Baptist churches causes an overhaul of church governance. I think it's time that we Southern Baptists were kind of jolted into reality. And faith in our sporting coaches is also shaken as a CBC investigation reveals more than 200 coaches in sport abused over 600 victims. You know, abuse happens every second of every minute of every hour. Where do we go from here? Healing from sexual abuse today on Context. I'm Lorna Duick. I'm Sheldon Neal. And I'm Molly Thomas. And this is Context. Catholic bishops are in Rome this week for a global summit to address the protection of minors in the church. The Canadian Catholic Church was key in having this issue reach Rome. In 1987, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops responded to outraged Canadian victims by circulating guidelines for punishing offending priests. Now, for the first time in history, a pope has summoned bishops to address the sexual crimes. Sheldon Neal has more. The summit comes just days after the former U.S. Cardinal and Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Theodore McCarrick, was removed from the priesthood. He's the first cardinal to be defrocked in the history of the Catholic Church. The Vatican found the 88-year-old guilty of sexually abusing children and adults. The lead-up to McCarrick's disgrace was tense in December, when the Pope Francis publicly announced that the Church will never seek to hush up or not take seriously any case of clergy sex abuse. Archbishop Charles Cicluna is one of the organizers of the upcoming summit in Rome and says the meeting of the Catholic leaders is a step in the right direction to find answers and solutions to an issue that has plagued the Catholic Church for generations. Whether it's criminal or malicious complicity and a code of silence or whether it's denial, we need to go away from that. The summit will focus on three key areas, responsibility, accountability, and transparency. Chicago Cardinal Blaise Shupich says one of the goals of the summit is to make sure all bishops know they will face severe consequences if they are complicit in any sexual abuse of minors. It's going to be a rallying moment to make sure that there are no misunderstandings. There's going to be every effort to close whatever loopholes there are to make sure that people understand on an individual basis as bishops what their responsibilities are, but then also to give them concrete steps uh, so that we understand exactly what's expected because they are going to be held accountable. If there's one light in this heinous issue within the Catholic Church, it's that this issue is finally being addressed openly. Joining us now to discuss the historic moment in the church is Father Michael Bouchard, chaplain at King's University College. Nice to have you, Father. Hey, thank you for having me. Father, there's so many survivors I'm reading about that are skeptical about this summit. Uh, what do you think it can actually do here? I think you know, arguably it's probably the most important gathering of bishops um, in the Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council. And I think really our, our credibility um, lies in the balance here. It's, um, I think people are keenly aware of, of how uh, far short we have fallen, especially when it comes to hearing and responding to the cries of survivors. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 if I was a survivor, I would feel the same way, I think, as, uh, as many of them do. Do you ever see uh, some of these people actually going back to their diocese and apologizing to people? You know, I think so. Um, in, in our own diocese here, Bishop Fabro uh, has done great work in apologizing to the victims. And uh, he has done that one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And he's also done that at large diocesan centers. And he's asked all of us also to um, be part of a, a yearly gathering where we pray for the, the survivors. I, I'm also aware of other bishops in Canada who've done something similar. Apologies, though, I think, you know, can often be cheap. And if they're just words, then they're only words. Mm -hmm. I think really what we need is um, a whole shift in attitude uh, with both the clergy and the laity of the church so that the church becomes once again... Uh, the place that Christ wants it to be. 
Father, how much of this problem, problem is about celibacy? The fact that priests can't have sex, can't have a family. I think people from the outside look in and say, well, well, there's the issue. Yeah, you know, I think it's probably part of the issue. And um, we know that celibacy is a discipline as opposed to a doctrine in the church. So the, uh, the possibility of changing the regulations around clerical celibacy could be done at, at any time. I think it's a problem insofar as uh, there may be historically and maybe even at present uh, some men or some women um, that haven't fully kind of integrated their sexuality and that have come to embrace um, celibacy as a gift that could be given to the church. I think that's, that's one piece of the equation. But, you know, even um, in our own country, within the last days, there's been a great report on um, coaches and other people involved in sporting activities that have also um, abused uh, minors in dozens of different types of sport. That doesn't excuse what's happened, um, either on their part or on our part. But I think uh, the abuse of, of children is about um, more than simply clerical celibacy. It's really a whole abuse of culture. Uh, or abuse of power within our culture. And I think really getting to those um, deeper systemic issues are really what we need to be looking at. Mm. Father Michael, great to have you on the program today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. There were two locations that have been Canada's ground zero for confronting sexual crimes in the Catholic Church, Mount Cashel Orphanage in Newfoundland and the Swales family of London, Ontario. John Swales and his brothers were sexually abused by a priest when they were children, and John Swales joins us now. John, thank you for being with us in 1996 when you came forward about the priest who abused um, the three of you as brothers. Just remind us what that was like. Well, you know, it's interesting because initially we didn't come out for ourselves. There was a young man who had been uh, recently sued the church for, for claims of sexual abuse by his uncle, who was a priest. And I had contacted his lawyer and said to the lawyer, listen, I can give you some collaborative evidence and uh, support this person. Uh, and when he heard our story, he kind of... Uh, suggested that we had a lawsuit and uh, at that point I went home and spoke with my parents and my siblings and uh, about the, the situation and we decided to embark on a, a journey and uh, seek some accountability. So how was it? It was intimidating, it was frightening and uh, it was a bit of an eye-opener at the end of the day. And um, you decided to drop the publication ban, you, your family went public, your mother says she cried for months. Um, I want to switch to, you You are so strong and healed. You're such a national advocate. But it wasn't always that way. It was worth it pushing through, I'm sure. But tell us about the journey from being a mess to now as we see you as national advocate. Well, uh, geez, I don't know. That's, that's a lot to fire into a few minutes. But uh, obviously, uh, my life had... Uh, spiraled out of control, drugs, alcoholism, uh, uh, I'll, I'll call it hedonistic behavior, but it was whatever whatever kind of behavior got us through the night uh, to, to where today, I, you know, if I fast forward it, and interestingly, I'm actually a, a university student today, which is quite uh, surprising for me uh, that I actually at 60 get to go to school. And, and pick up some of the skills that I didn't get as a young man. John, not only in a Catholic university, but you also wrote a letter to the Pope this fall saying what you believe needs to happen in order for victims to heal. Tell us more about that letter. Well, I think it's multifaceted. There's, there's not only the, the survivors, but there's their families, the church itself, the laity, the entire body of the Catholic Church is reeling and, and I frankly felt that uh, I, I see the Pope as the, the, the chief executive officer, for, for lack of better words, and he's the man in charge. And I felt that it was important to speak to him and, uh, and suggest that he do what I believe the church should be doing. And that's, uh, you know, spreading Jesus' message and, and taking care of people in need that want to be taken care of. Okay, Not, John. Uh, I love that you've got a support group circle up now. Thank you so much for uh, having that available for the public to tap into. We'll just put uh, openingthecircle.ca up on the screen right now. John, 
Thank you for sharing your story and inviting others to tell their story at Opening the Circle. Thank you, John. Thank you. We should be the example of how to live this life. Uh, and if we're not, we don't deserve to hold the position. To the U.S. now and another abuse of faith. This time, nearly 400 Southern Baptist Convention leaders are accused of sexual misconduct against 700 victims since 1998. It's a sex scandal that has exposed those abusing their influence and power in the church. Dr. Serene Jones is the president of Union Theological Seminary. She joins me now from New York City. Doctor, you've said before the church cannot stay silent on these issues. What should we do then in wake of this tragedy? Well, there is so much we should say. We should be talking about it as you are today, um, and we should not stop talking about it until radical change happens. You know, when I heard those numbers, um, 400 uh, clergy accused, 700 victims, you know that the real numbers have to be five times at least as high, um, given um, how hard it is for people to come forward in these contexts. And I have to say that, sadly, um, given the history of patriarchy and power in the church, um, it's not surprising to me. Well, this doctor is obviously an abuse of power problem. So, so what needs to change in the church? Well, it's very easy, as I have read about what's happening in the Southern Baptist Church, and to think that if you have more education classes for clergy, and if you give them more trainings on not overstepping boundaries, that you're going to address the issue. And while I think those are absolutely important, and every seminary should require any pastor going into a church to take these courses and be trained, absolutely. And there needs to be strictures, and there needs to be accountability. But all of those things um, in place are not going to prevent this from happening until the underlying theology upon which the whole structure is built is changed. As long as you have a theology where at the very top of that theology is God the Father, and you have a theology which says only men can be representatives or witnesses publicly to this father. You've set up a patriarchal structure um, where women and children are always put in a subservient and submissive role. And there's no way a structure like that will not always lead to the potential for abuse. So then why should people trust the church? Well, they have a lot of good reasons not to trust the church. And uh, maybe one of the things that we need to be inside the church teaching our own children is that uh, that they should not have unquestioned trust in the church or in their pastors, um, that their trust should lie in the witness of Jesus Christ. Um, but we need to stop building idols and icons that we attribute too much power to, and we block out the gospel message. That's the message that should be trust, and that's where our faith should be. Thank you. Dr. Serene Jones for joining us. Thank you, Molly. Well, the church response to sexual abuse allegations is often part of the controversy. Josh Laxton has been a Southern Baptist pastor. He's now with the Billy Graham Center in Wheaton. Josh, when we hear about the wrath of God, uh, when God's people are hurt and suffering at the hands of the church leaders, turning a blind eye, you know, as we read the Southern Baptist case, the expose in the Houston Chronicle, even some victims were blamed, some cases, um, women having to apologize for being pregnant. How, and yet their pastor who impregnated them not being named, how did this ever go under the radar like this? Yeah, Lorna, that is a, a great question, and the short answer is it shouldn't. Uh, the people of God should never sweep sin under the rug. They should always expose that sin should always be brought to the light, for that's what Jesus would have us to do. So how will the Southern Baptist Convention, very high-profile church in America, regain the trust of people? Well, trust is built over time, especially especially in situations like this where we have dropped the ball. And so we're going to have to slowly over time build trust. Well, Josh, we know now what wasn't done at the Southern Baptist Convention for the sexual abuse issues. 
what can be done at the local church level? Yeah, that's a great question, Lorna. So four quick things. One, churches need to be realistic. I know that there are those that would say, oh, this can never happen in our faith community. And the truth of the matter, it can and it has. The, the second thing they need to do is that they need to be educational. Pastors and other leaders need to be equipped as well as their, their lay staff and, and even their members to deal with allegations and to deal with survivors. Third, they need to be very practical. Churches need to have more of a rigorous procedure when it comes to hiring new staff. And so they just don't need to be contacting people on the resume in terms of the references. They need to go even beyond that to find out who they really are hiring. And then last but not least, they need to be biblical. To hire a person that has a tainted past, many people would see that as redemptive and restorative. But to hire people with tainted past when it comes to sexual misconduct and put them in similar environments, that's not redemptive and restorative. That is reckless. And then on top of that, to even put them in similar positions and not disclose that, that's not only reckless, that is criminally negligent. And so as the church, we need to be the light in this area and we need to expose darkness. And that is, that, that are, those are some steps that we can take as we move forward in this era. Okay, Josh Laxton, the Billy Graham Center in Wheaton, thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, a closer look at sexual abuse in sports. Former NHL star Theo Fleury on the trauma of being abused by his former hockey coach. And a survivor of clergy abuse on how both victims and the church can heal after sexual abuse. One of the worst parts of this entire process, knowing as I began to realize what had happened to me, how many other little girls had been left destroyed too. And the sentence you impose today will send a message about how much these precious women and children are worth. That woman's making history there, um, Sheldon and Molly. Uh, she's um, not only successfully seen USA Gymnastics accountable for the abuse of 150 girls, she's also going to be part of the Southern Baptist Curriculum Committee. They're doing 12 curriculum, so pastors will stop this problem mm -hmm. of sexual abuse. Of course, the Southern Baptist with 700 victims now on their hands. And now we've lost faith in sports too, Molly. I'm so disappointed in the uh, Canadian news. Here. Yeah, recently uh, a CBC News and Sports exclusive pointed out that there is a massive problem with the abuse of children by coaches. Those, those stats are shocking, Rachel. It's unbelievable. This CBC investigation found that in the last two decades, over 300 coaches across Canada have been charged with sexual offenses against minors. Just over 200 have been convicted though. Mm -hmm. And there are 34 trials going on right now. Uh, we know that hockey, we see the most convictions and charges. Uh, soccer is second mm -hmm. with uh, the fastest growing sport in Canada. Okay. So it's all very, very scary. It is unbelievable. A well-known survivor of mm -hmm. sexual abuse and advocate for change is hockey legend Theo Fleury. Talking about hockey there. Mm -hmm. Had a chance to catch up with him to discuss recovery, healthy ways forward. Take a look. Theo, take us to that moment. How hard was it, your internal process, to revealing what was such a long-held secret of chronic sex abuse at the hands of your then junior hockey coach? Well, it wasn't that hard at all. You know, I think I was ready to do it. And, uh, you know, obviously it was a, you know, important story for me to tell from, you know, uh, sort of a universal perspective. Uh, you know, it helped me uh, find my voice and, and, you know, by me finding my own voice, I helped a lot of other people, uh, you know, do the same. Uh, you've said the abuse you experienced transformed you from a confident child at one point to a man who blew millions. Uh, you described yourself as a boozer. Uh, describe the transformation that took place inside of you during this time. You know, it's it's about coping on a day to day basis. And, uh, you know, I really shouldn't be here. I should have died a long time ago. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's <clears throat> it's more important that we. Um, paint a story here that, uh, you know, healing is possible and that uh, no matter what type of uh, coping mechanisms we used in the past, uh, you know, it's all about uh, the recovery and the process of, uh, you know, of healing. 
when you hear of recent sex abuse and sports scandals just breaking out in media, I wonder, what goes through your mind? I'm not surprised, you know. Um, I'm actually waiting for the next story to break. So, you know, <clears throat> you know, sexual uh, abuse of any kind is probably, you know, right up there with one of the biggest epidemics on the planet. You know, uh, child expo exploitation, child uh, prostitution is slowly becoming one of the biggest businesses in the world. So, um, you know, I'm not surprised. I'm not shocked. Uh, and like I said, I, I'm waiting for, you know, the next story to, to break, which probably is going to happen sooner rather than later. What needs to change, I wonder, to ensure increased safety in sport for athletes, especially in establishing, you know, what's called the red flag athlete coach boundaries? You know, institutions won't treat, uh, teach you morals. You know, institutions will only teach you about cover up because if we look through the past, you know, Catholic Church, you know, where basically this all started, you know, is probably the richest organization in the world. So, you know, they're able to afford to pay for all the lawsuits. They're able to pay uh, for cover up, you know, Penn State, uh, perfect example. You know, I think they used to get something like, I don't know, $50 million from Nike uh, for all their sports teams to wear Nike. And so, you know, they had a lot of... Uh, a lot of money and, and uh, you know, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's about money and money equals power. And then once people have power, then that's when the abuse happens. Theo Fleury, um, I know you just got off the plane. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Thanks for joining me. Well, what's transpired in the world of sports in Canada lately has many people concerned, especially parents, over the well-being and safety of their children. And Nicole Chang joins me now. Your daughter, Tia, uh, is a rising volleyball player. And perhaps even if dreams of playing with her country opened up, she would definitely go for it. Uh, uh, question to you, why do you feel it necessary, especially when she's on the road, to travel with her? You know, why is that such an important thing for you? I'm her bodyguard. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important to have parental presence um, with sports. I know once upon a time they would, you know, send the kids off in a bus and uh, they're just gone um, with the team. Uh, but now um, it's, it's a lot more open for parents to come to the tournaments, to the games, to travel, whether it be through the like on plane, everything. We don't just send the kids anymore. Um, some still do. They might send with another parent. But as for me, um, I have four daughters, so I'm already hyper vigilant uh, when it comes to um, watching over my children and making sure that uh, they are taking care of everywhere they go. And when you talk about precautions, you know, I mean, T, even she could even be here today because she's getting ready to play. Yes. So the business, what kind of precautions, maybe a checklist you go through that you can share with us yes. that, you know, when you're watching? Um, first and foremost, I, I don't mix words with my daughter. I let her know from a very young age about touch, um, what is appropriate touch and what is not appropriate. And if you feel uncomfortable around anybody, um, to come and talk to me. Um, Are you worried when you hear of the things in the news headlines and then now you know your daughter continues to stay active? I, I do get worried when I hear about it and I always think what other, what, what, and what other thing that I can do to ensure my child would be safe. A lot of it is I'm just going to be there. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us, and, and good luck to your daughter as she plays Thank for that you. championship game as we speak. Coming up, is healing after sexual abuse possible? How a clergy abuse survivor is working with religious institutions to move forward. Well, can we find healing? after sexual abuse in the church. Leah Karen Keevy is a survivor of clergy sexual abuse, now works with survivors and religious institutions. Uh, Leah, I'm sad to say that you have been abused in both the Protestant and the Catholic church, and it has given you a very unusual ground to now be an educator, but I've got to ask this first, why did you not leave Christianity over this? 
oh, God is God and the church is a human institution, although, you know, it was developed um, or inspired by the Lord, but uh, Jesus is always faithful. Uh, you'll never go wrong if you keep your eyes on the Lord, but, um, you know, if we look to humans for our comfort or our support, that's where we get into dangerous ground. You have been on almost a 30-year journey learning and navigating this ground. And one thing I think people don't realize is how short the bridge between spiritual intimacy can sometimes go to physical intimacy. Mm -hmm. And here you are uh, going in for spiritual direction with a priest. There's a bed in his office. You wanted to run, obviously. Mm -hmm. Just remind us again about the warning signs and when you know you should flee. Oh, I would say um, it's hard because I would like to just bring up the topic of a vulnerable person. Someone who is not in a state of crisis would automatically say, this is not okay, let's go out of here. But if you're in a state of crisis, you don't even notice what's in the room. You might say, okay, well, that's there, but you're not paying attention, you're in crisis. So that's the part that's important is you, you can't, you can't leave it to the victims to defend themselves, to the vulnerable people to defend themselves. It's up to the communities of priests or spiritual directors to make a safe environment and never have a spiritual director bring you to their private quarters. And we're thankful you've worked on resources. We've used them at Context Before, Abuse in the Church. Um, and I'm loving that you now have online support groups. So yes. you've got the workbook manuals. But now uh, tell us about this website and how it works for victims. Yes, I just launched uh, listeningplace.ca, uh, even though since 2015 I've been bringing uh, church leaders together, I've been bringing survivors together in Australia, in England, in uh, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, but now we're having a, a website and we're going to schedule uh, regular meetings so that people can just drop in as they Online. want, although um, they would need to be invited first. So if they go to the website listeningplace.ca, there's a web or a email address there and um, I can invite them to a meeting. Okay. Leah, thank you for having a place for victims to gather and thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Predatory rapists have taken children, teenagers, and vulnerable adults in the halls of churches and sports venues. And part of the media role has been to hear the anger of victims and create a public forum that says we must listen, believe, and restore power to victims. Our context team has left great links on our website for how you can get connected to support groups, to the guests featured today, and learn more on the work of healing from sexual abuse. For all of us at Context, I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for joining us.